Verse 14, he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Chapter 13 of the same book, we have another man by the name of Abijah. The 18th year of King Jeroboam began Abijah to reign over Judah. And I would like to go on to the 10th verse, but as for us, this is Abijah's statement, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. Would you please again go to the 15th chapter of the same book? Beginning at verse 10, this happens to be a man by the name of Asa. So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month in the fifteenth year of the reign of Asa. And they offered unto the Lord at the same time of the spoil which they had brought, seven hundred oxen and seven thousand sheep. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their hearts. and with all their souls, that whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. And they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice, and with shouting, and with trumpet, and with cornet. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath. For they had sworn with all their hearts and sought him with their whole desire, and he was found of them. Notice the three attitudes of the three kings. Rehoboam established himself and forsook the Lord and all his willing. I would call that deterioration. I believe you would agree with me that that's true. They lost ground. They went down. They went backwards. And it was considered evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. <coughs> we find the other king by the name of Elijah. He says, The Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. Now here's one that has <coughs> forsaken, let down, went back, deteriorated. Here's one that says, he's our God. We have at least one boast that we haven't forsaken. But here's another one that screams and causes all the people to scream with him and offer sacrifices by the heat, and brings the musical instrument, and blows the horns, and shouts, and cries at God, both small and great, and issues an order that those that didn't do it would be put to death. And he says, let's advance. The three attitudes of the three kings could easily be manifest in us. Now, I'm going to mark off the first one because I don't believe I'm talking to anybody like this. <clears throat> don't think I have to deal at all today with the deteriorating. I believe you men are at least holding what you got. And maybe more, but I'm going to talk to you as though you're guilty, if you'll allow me. And then if you're not, it won't hurt you. If you are, it could help you. As far as I'm concerned, the first two that I've mentioned to you are both very dangerous attitudes. Damaging and dangerous. One forsook the Lord. He went backwards. He didn't even hold his own. He didn't even take what was handed to him and retain it. And invariably, a man of God influences his congregation. 
and all this was with him. The next man comes along and he says, well, I feel very uh, proud of myself today. The Lord's our God. Almost a monopoly attitude that he's ours, nobody else's. Now, this man may not have meant that, but I want to tell you, when you get to this point, you are so near that attitude until if you don't say it, it's, uh, it's just a thin line. He's our God and nobody else's, and, and uh, we have not forsaken the Lord. Well, that's commendable. Well, this exception is dangerous, extremely so. Good has always been an enemy of the bad, and always will be. And this is the attitude that I'm more worried about today, because really the ones who are forsaking the Lord, I have no way to reach them today. I don't feel like I'm even available. <coughs> Men that are going to deteriorate that far from God in holiness and spirituality and, and whatever else that we have had in Pentecost don't want to hear me anyhow. So I'm not talking to them. Mark an X through that one. That's not us. We're not worried about it. I could develop into that, but it's this point. Number two is uh, the attitude of maintenance. Then you've got a wrecking crew, and you've got a maintenance crew, and you've got a construction gang. Now you can choose as a preacher which one you want in your church. Now everybody's got his own ministry, and I'm giving credit for that. That there's some men who are teachers. Some men are teachers. And uh, I don't suppose we'll ever be anything else but that. So I grant you that maybe that's, that's an acceptable thing that you have a ministry that is not necessarily evangelistic. I suppose we'd have to admit that. The fivefold ministry, I guess, would teach us that. But I don't believe that it teaches me that if, even though I'm just a teacher, that my teaching is a total maintenance job. It seems to me the fivefold ministry was for the edifying of the body of Christ. Is that what you read in your mind? It's to edify, to upbuild. And the danger, as I see it, and of course I hate to be the last speaker at a seminar like this, we've heard it all just about today. I don't know anything else we could say. But at least let me drop this, and when you go home, try to remember what I'm saying, that this spirit is in our land today, and I don't know anybody that's got it any worse than we got. The attitude is that if I reach out for the law or advance in number, that I am obligated to let down on the message, or that, that this is what I would be doing to do that. Uh, <clears throat> the spirit to retain holiness or doctrine is thought to be of offense to the outreach. Uh, bless God, uh, if I use too many uh, gimmicks or programs or ideas or reach for too many, it will water us down and we'll lose the message. So as a result, I am going to go into a loose shell of maintenance. My entire ministry and the idea of the church will be, church, come tomorrow night and I'll maintain you. Now, what is difficult, and every speaker has a problem, when you emphasize one point, you almost sound like you're contradicting another. Well, the majors was almost sounding like that he was contradicting Mother Green, but really and truly there was no contradiction at all. Yeah, right. It just one go get them, emphasizing that point, and another one hold them after you get them. Yeah. Now, what I'm saying, maintain, I am not contradicting Brother Major's point at all. 
that's all. If we don't keep what we're gaining, we still haven't gained. But when I'm talking about maintenance, I'm not so much talking about just holding that thing. I'm talking about attitudes. I'm talking about efforts. I'm talking about what is your church doing? What are you doing? What do you study your Bible for? Is it for a sermon to maintain? You can still get to enjoying that type of preaching that everything you look for would be a blood and guts type sermon. And you know that to be the truth. What you enjoy preaching, you invariably look for it in this book. But actually, you could have looked for a variety. But I, only, I believe you can only maintain so long without advances, and you will revert back to the first attitude of deterioration. Some folks think that the, just, just, just hope. We're not going to go no further than half a dozen and no more, but I'm going to perfect them. How can I perfect them? With a maintenance attitude only. Perfection comes more than just saying, don't do this, and don't do that, and don't do the other, and we're not going to give up our message of holiness, and we're not going to give up this, and we're going to hold our line on this. Then after a while, people get to milling around, and they get hungry. And the desire for excitement comes, and the advancement desire is there, because to tell you the truth, the Holy Ghost that you get desires advancement. And if that Holy Ghost is going to work in your life very much, it's going to tell you something to do that will advance your church and your cause. Or should I say the cause of God? I, have, I fear more than anything else among us today, and maybe I should, maybe I'm in the wrong place. But I fear the desire to maintain has hindered us in our advancement. Now, what I can do this year will be determined by what I get it out of here and from anyone else and from God in prayer. And I'm going to have to shut off some attitude. I'm going to have to get rid of some things. I saw myself reflected today many times. And I'm, many times I was sad over it. I have to say that uh, it seemed that every message has brought me a threat with a zeal and desire to go do something now. But the Spirit has a way of getting away from it. Functions and desires have a way of leading. Especially if the old rut of maintenance has been the place you dwell so long. You're going to slip back in there. You're going to have the tendency to forget any inspirational thoughts you've had and say, uh, well, at least I'm holding my own. At least uh, I've still got 150 or whatever. How can I face the eternal God and a world that's lost and relax myself to the status quo and say, that's all I want? And I'm scared of anything else. And I appreciate every attitude today when they refer to promotional ideas they at least gave them credit for what they do not being the total answer but giving credit we had 528 in sunday school three sundays ago i believe it was it was a strictly thoroughbred 100 percent promotional deal we just simply gave candy and gifts and bicycle and and paraphernalia and money hunts, we had the work. And that Bible is what it is. It was chaos. 528, I told Johnny Will Hardy, he was the big instigator of it. I said, if I hear that name again, I'm going to send you plumb to the Philippines. That's where he's going in. Of course, I really. I can't handle 528 right now. But here's what I want to say. I cannot say, look, we're running. And I went to Houston. They were down in the 30s and 40s, and we're now over 200. Boy, 
زیاد بدی preached on television, I think, uh, against it about once or twice, maybe, since I've been to Houston. I'm talking about I may just casually mention it, but I don't ever take it as a subject. I haven't needed to yet. If I ever do, I will. I don't, uh, I don't guess I've preached on rings. I've got folks that's been in my church nearly a year begging me to come to their house and explain why I'm against rings <laughs> and don't have any in the church. Now, I am not underestimating this message, brother, and I am not cutting one arm off the strength of the other, but I refuse to just take the attitude that this is all I am left here for. And the last closing few gasping moments, in our last dying throw, I'm going to try my best to maintain. I refuse that attitude. I will not have it. Don't bring it around me. I'm running from it. I don't want to receive it because the last closing moments of this church, in my opinion, should return to the original level of the early church. Yes, I'll tell you what's needed. If somebody would arise with the ace of spirit that says, with all of my heart, I am crying to God. You folks come out here and meet me today and bring your tamarind. And bring your horns and bring your sacrifices. And it's so serious that it's going to be a law that if you don't do it, you die. Now, I don't know just how, what direction you could preach that, but I say this. We either sacrifice or die. We either consecrate or die. Our churches get closer to God or die. Face it. We either advance or die. What's all the commotion about? What's all the transition about? What's all of it? Why are we even here tonight? A miracle of God brought me to this little room in Charleston, Louisiana. A miracle of God brought you and I together here tonight. A divine hand ordered it well. Planned it and nothing that could be done to stop it. Because God knows that in the bosom of some men there's a desire to do more than maintain it. And God knows there's a desire to do more than deteriorate. Yes. My desire is screaming within me tonight. And that's why the first week in May and I take this opportunity to invite every one of you preachers. The first week in May is a fast conference in Greensboro. For three days. If it's just Mother Lawrence and myself, we have pledged ourselves for a three-day fast conference to seek the living God, that the signs and the wonders and the miraculous would be granted unto us. But in with all that we gain, let us gain the miraculous. What ease it is to say to a man that Jesus' name baptism is right when you pray the prayer of faith for him and his baby is well now. Dear God, what else, what better could you offer? A friend of mine said a Baptist woman came to his congregation, previously at Fort Pentecost, totally blind. Someone persuaded her to come. She came and was prayed for, and God instantly healed her. As a result, you figure the rest out. What do you think happened? They could have almost told her the moon was cheese, and she didn't believe it. Dear Lord, I came here blind, and now I see her. You know, it's the attitude of the man that got healed. They started questioning on technical points. He said, all I know is, whereas I was blind, now I see. Or whereas I was lame, now I walk. All I know is the man said, get your bed and get out of here. And I just listened to him and it worked. He wasn't interested in technical points. He was glad for the power and the ability to be able to walk again. I do not overemphasize that. Doctrine, all of the points that go wrong, 
As they dig up the right foundation, maintain that, but use that only as a launching pad. Let's get up in orbit where our cookies will sure not flow. There is a place in God for the ministry. You know what I've learned, and I believe it? I believe it with everything in me. I believe my prayers match the prayers of an entire congregation. I believe I can outplay everything in my church. I believe everyone in that church collected in one building and me on the platform on my knees, God's listening to me. Are you listening? I'm not offensive. I'm, I'm I believe my prayer carries the greater weight of that entire congregation. That does not minimize the fact that they can touch God and every believer has a right to approach God and I'm not a high priest and they don't have to come in to me for forgiveness. But I believe as a God-called preacher, I believe we have the power to move things that saints will never know. God has to honor us in that ministry. He couldn't have put, if we've got any stripes, if we've got any bars on our lapel, if, if there is an honor to the ministry, there's got to be some way or another. As a friend of the bridegroom that I have the right and privilege of approach that the bride doesn't have until the climax of the wedding. It is certainly, I feel with all assurance, that when a preacher touches God, it's equivalent to a whole church. The reason I believe that I've been in churches in revival. And there wasn't enough faith, there wasn't enough anything going on. Unconcerned seemed to paralyze the whole congregation. Lifeless beings sat there looking at you as though you were something to be auctioned off. But I spent a few hours in the midnight time talking to God. And friend, I'm not boasting, I'm just saying God, I believe, listens to a preacher's prayer. I want you to know one man with like passion as we prevail with the high God of heaven. When it was dry times and young men were fainting for thirst. And they were watching babies being devoured by their own mothers. Critical moments. And the old prophet sat down on the hillside and shook the dust out of his mantle. It had been dry so long. It was time to not maintain but advance. And he said, O oh, King of Israel, O oh, God of heaven, O oh, King of the saints, bow down your ear and send us some rain. I want you to know it didn't make any difference what existed. That old boy's prayer reached the heart of God. And I believe when preachers pray, my own personal experience is this. I have gone to services and promoted worship and didn't get it like it needed to be. You know what happened? I was asking them to do something I didn't really have myself that night. Come on, let's admit what some of the weakness is. You don't have to do it to them, but let's admit it. Let's be honest. There are times when the insufficiency dwells in us within today. And Brother Lee, I've gone aside after recognizing I felt like I lost that night. I thought I lost on a certain front. And I can't stand it. Something in me screams. I can't stand it. And I'm going along with God and I mean dug in myself. And the next night, I didn't ask them to worship. The flow was so great in me, it, it bursted out. And as a result, they just simply did it. I believe when I'm in touch and plugged up like I ought to be plugged up, not every time. I certainly recognize that. But there is a great value in my reaching God and being on fire for God. It's dangerous when a man learns to promote prayer in his church and don't have praise there. It's dangerous for a man to learn to promote worship and he doesn't do it either. And there are men that can do that. I'm talking about they can move a church for any direction they want to go and then back off and relax and not do a thing about it. They've got the ability to do that. But I tell you what he's doing, he's endangering himself to fall. That's all I'm going to say, is fall. Because you've got to have a personal devotion yourself to be saved. There comes a time when you need to forget congregation, family, center, everybody, 
and get along with God and get your soul soaked up with the good presence of Almighty God. I say it's consecration and plants or die. The children will die. The women will die. The men will die. The order was come with your sacrifice. We're not going to deteriorate and we're not going to maintain. Boys, we're going beyond what any king's ever done before us. We're going to call a sacrifice like never been known. We're screaming at God. The Bible said they got out there and shouted aloud and, and conceived an oath that between their heart and God that we're going to get closer to you. We're going to do more for you. We're going to have more from you. And the Bible said God heard them. I believe it still hears. I believe we can still attain. Mighty revival. I'm talking about, uh, when I say 83 plays through, it's hard in that small number compared to what God wants to do in the land day. We lack, if God don't perform a miracle, we lack yet five to ten years to recover what the status quo attitude has destroyed. I've had young men that come to me as sincere as they could be. I said, Brother Bean, I'm trying to believe that you really did have hate for you. Can't Another one said, yeah, but Haiti went back too, didn't he? I mean, they told me. Impossible to have it. Where did this come from? You know where it came from? It started with a man and went to beyond that point of deterioration. I'm saying, brethren, you can be satisfied. I preached in a church one time, and uh, they had heard Holman. They had heard all of these. That's all they had. It was become a competitive thing that the man that preached for him had to preach harder than he did. And then when he left, he had to try to match that. Now, that, that's become a game, you know, that's, that's right, that's not, uh, that's, really, that's not even maintaining, that's a game. Who can preach the hardest, or who can, you know, and, uh, you know, I believe in holding it, I refuse anything else. I believe anybody that knows knows I believe that, and I am not opposing preaching it, and I've done it, and I've done it as hard as anybody. But I refuse to confine myself to that total ministry. I don't have to. I found out that a lot of the maintenance, <laughs> just the good old man will keep you from having a good old man. If you'll just keep the power of God flowing, that won't be the total solution, <laughs> but it'll help a lot. Now, I don't believe in just keeping a worship never preach against anything, does it? It'll creep in anyhow. But I'm saying a mixed, wonderful balance, but a constant desire for deeper things, higher things, greater things. We compare ourselves with ourselves, and we do not well. This makes us maintain. This makes us settle down. We get in a vicious circle of saying, my neighbor's got, and then you got, and then I got two, two, three, two, three, nine. Well, I mean, you got, well, I got two fish. Well, I mean, this is what. And we've got in a vicious cycle, or we can, let's put it that way. Then we compare ourselves with ourselves. Now, I asked Sunday school records attendance myself about reaching the law. Friend, if that, if that was all, if it was counting marbles and marbles is all it was, I'd say forever get you 220 and put them in a sack and tie it. And put the sack in your pocket and go home. But their souls are sorry. And when I tied the sack, I left somebody out. When I got the, the attitude that everything's running all right, and we've not forsaken the Lord, we still our God, and we had a good shouting service the other night, and we had a pretty good move of God. Pretty now, but what have you done to we Brother Green shook me today. And the Lord he shook. Brother Green, I refuse. I'm not competing with you, but I refuse to let a little old thin man at least do more faster than praying than I'm doing for all souls. 
I refuse to have a church that won't pray as much as his praying. Anybody think good, I can do it. If I get out of the attitude and quit comparing myself in numbers of Sunday school wise and standard wise, we're still doing all right. Friend, but that's not the all there is from this gospel. Oh, God, there's a multiplier. There's an addition to this thing. And I'm contending we want to have signs and wonders in the apostolic church of Jesus Christ and we're going to help. We're going to scream to God. We're going to blow trumpets and we're going to sound alarms. And we're going to enter into an oath with God. If I ever had it, we should have it. Oh, there's a loneliness in my soul. You know, maybe you're not affected tonight, but I am. I'm just as shook as I can be. I, I wish, I wish for me a room somewhere by myself right now for about an hour or two. I'd like to tell God all oh, my heart telling me right now. I want something from heaven. Brother, I want more than a, don't misunderstand me. I want more than information of, in a seminar. I'd like for these things to turn into faith-building rallies. That men will walk out of here so afraid. Did you hear Brother Green say he took on a new dimension? I know what he's talking about. I went on the evangelistic field and had preachers set out on me to where I couldn't preach. <laughs> I had one pastor tie me up so one night, and he did it on purpose and laughed about it the next day. I heard him. Well, he's getting tied up to me. Preach for him a year later in the first night in the pulpit. I looked at him and I told the audience, I said, You've got a different evangelist tonight than you had before. Another anointing came on me. I knew I had it. And an authority with it, not an unkindness, but an authority with it. And a power that could not be questioned. And friend, we're going to have to have a new dimension. God grant us a new dimension in our ministry. Would you, with an oath tonight with me, pledge to God? I won't be the same in prayer before as I was before. I will not be the same in my fasting. I will not be the same in my ministry. I will give myself unto God. Notice how they did it. Would you please notice the wording? Entered into covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their hearts and with all their souls. Undivided it and swear unto the Lord with a loud voice and was shouting. Do you know I when I read that I see nothing but fervor. I see nothing but sincerity. Man, I don't see casual attitudes anywhere around there, do you? I don't see pockets of of unconcern. I see a whole audience recognizing it was a matter of life and death with. Because the leader says, look, boy, we got to have it. And a statement, a previous statement in that same chapter gives us the idea of why. An old prophet came along and told this man then. He went out to me and he said, let him hear it to me. The Lord is with you while you be with him. If you'll seek him, he'll be found now, for a long season, Israel had been without the true God. And this desperation grabbed Asa because he suddenly realized for a long time we haven't seen what we need to see. And he said, boy, there's life or death now. You can, you can casually sh shove it aside and say, I'll get to that later. Brethren, when it comes to the miraculous and divine healing, Faith and power and consecration. We made jokes out of the whole thing. But I beg you to seriously consider that it's life and death, man. If I survive, I advance. I highly commend David. And I feel a whole lot like the old boy. Man, I read it for yourself sometime. It's an interesting. Story and it fits me because I guess it kind of a little sentimental. Here he was in the midst of a heated battle, but previous verses tell me that he had won successful victories, great victories. The multitude gathered unto him.
opened themselves to him, to help him with life. He had prospered, the Bible says, greatly. And notice the success. <coughs> uh, prospered, numbers added, great numbers. One great picture, as the Bible says. But he was sitting there and got to thinking about that old well at the gate. Then, now don't tell me he didn't have any water. I believe he did. Tell me the king was out there without water. I believe he had some. But he got to thinking about the well. Yeah. And talking out loud, thinking out loud, he he said, oh, that someone would get me a drink of the water of the well at the gate in Bethlehem. Those old brave men shook themselves. They heard him. We can't let our king desire something. And I knew he was sincere. He said, I don't know which is the hottest part of this battle, but we're breaking ranks and we're going through. And they went and they got got some water out of that old well. And Lord, you realize what dangers are between us and the king? But we're going to get him this water. And those champions came barging through it fearlessly. And they brought him the water. And David, here is the water of the well to eat. And he looked at it. And I can't do anything. Pour it out. But not, that'd be like taking your fellow and cutting your jugular vein and sucking the blood out of it. That's the blood of those men that shepherded their lives for my sake. That's what I'm trying to say. Now look what I'm trying to show you. The honorable part of me that was this. Look, friend, please. He had had success. He had won victories. He had had numbers added to him. And God had prospered in the book that read the previous verses. But there was yet a wrong in his heart. Let me spiritualize it right now. If I was running a thousand or you, and you had the prettiest building in the country, if you've ever tasted a real move of God, you'll sit down in the midst of all of that and you cry. And you'll beg God. I'd like to see you. Yeah, but the numbers increase. That don't make no difference. If you've ever known God in consecration, that won't satisfy you. Yeah, but I'm prospering. I've got more than I ever had. Brother, if your heart's ever touched the tune of consecration, and power with God, that won't do it. Hallelujah. It won't do it, brother. It won't do it. Brother, why do you listen to it? Man, if you've ever gone to a closet in prayer and knew the depth of consecration, there's not a car that could give you, there's not a church you could pastor, and there's not prosperity you could have, and there's no gain in numbers, and there is no gain anywhere that will take the place. Now that was, now that was an honorable thing. I don't, what well, to me that was just natural. And forgive me, but I would, would like to be back in some of the services I've known at one time. I know we don't look back from the standpoint of want to go back, but please understand me. I've been in some simple services when I was just a little country boy that my heart longed. Okay, I'm sentimental, but I've been in revivals and the heat was on. And a bunch of carnal men could have almost gnashed on me with their teeth. And the thing looked like was ready to explode. And the battle on all sides fighting every victory march I ever had. I longed so much to go back to the old overall when nobody thought anything was wrong with a victory march. First place didn't have to help. It was a matter of getting them settled down to where you could preach. 
Now don't tell me I'm wrong to long for the spirit that prevails. I don't want to go back to the sweat back garages and the old lanterns. But dear Jesus, I would like to get to the service where there wasn't no pride and everybody was hungry for God. Oh, no. Now don't tell me that I can't get hungry for that. But on the other hand, here is the mistake David made, and please, <coughs> please, would you admit if you've made it, would you say, God forgive me for the same mistake? You know what he did? He was thinking out loud. And he said, if I just had, if someone would get me a drink. And he prospered and gained love and should be satisfied, but he didn't. At least the hunger was there. But brethren, I'm trying to drive a point. I don't know if you're catching it or not. He was, he was advanced beyond the stage of maintenance, at least in desire. Now, I've got that today. I'm just clawing, man. I'm, I'm all this tired, but I feel better. Dear Lord, I want to go home and have a revival so bad I can't help Amen. And we can all leave here with a little sentimental poem. Oh, that one would come and kiss me on the night. Oh, that someone would bring me a drink. And, and fresh you can, you can throw that off on your church. If my church would just really get consecrated and get us all the drink, we want the church to pray now. It's a preacher friend. What's going wrong with everybody? Everybody's losing the power. I wish somebody was going to get that old fashioned. Now, David's desire was all right, but notice how he put it. Oh, that someone would bring it to me. I could just go to a seminar, seminary, or seminar and have a look. If somebody could bring it. Oh, I heard about Leo Red Dog Evangelist. Maybe he can do it. Friend, you know where it's coming from? Did David get a drink from the water? The three men jeopardizing their lives, did it profit David? I'm going to say this for preacher or saint. I don't believe you'll get out of the move of God what you would have gotten out of it unless you put something into that move. If you wait for somebody else to do your praying and fasting and consecrating and, and doing whatever needs to be done to get an old-fashioned move of God, when it comes, you won't, you won't be a, a part of it enough then, Joe. It'll be poured at your feet. The brave men that jeopardize their lives. That's not going to help you. You know what I'm convinced of tonight? I've been doing what David said. I'm just going to be honest and confess that I've been doing what David said. Myself. Praise God forever. I refuse to be anything less than a nation. I am going to have a little mind. I'm going to have a little of God. <laughs> and when the seminar is over with and when we have gone home, I'm still going to have a revival. I refuse to wait on any preacher to come and produce it. I welcome them. I want them and I need them. But I don't want him to just come and sit down there and wait till he gets there and try to get him to stir me. Please, God, help me to get a hold of something tonight that will advance. Can you say amen to that? Amen.
HGR, Holy Ghost Radio. I'm one God from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There is one Lord, there is one faith, there is one baptism, there is one God who is Father of all, who is above all, who is through all, who is in you all. Jesus said, I am my Father one. He said, when you see me, you've seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Now believe us, there is one God. Now do as well. The devils also believe and tremble. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? For more information, visit our website at www.holyghostradio.com.